There we go. Live and recording. Fancy. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna go, I'll go through these slides and I may or may not stop for questions, but uh, I will stop at the end and leave plenty of time for questions. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Looks like 121 of you so far. That's great. Somebody's calling me. Matty Groves. All right, call him back. Uh, let's get started. Let me share my screen. And we'll go for it. I don't know if there's any video in this. I don't think there is. There we go. Um, okay, <clears throat> let's get started. So we're gonna talk about some lake trout fishing tonight. I'm gonna start off by saying, uh, I do not consider myself the best lake trout fisherman in the world. I love it. Uh, I will say that, that I am extremely passionate about it and I'm just going to share how I attack it. And there are going to be people who watch this video that are going to say, Oh, well, what about this? And you didn't mention that and you should do this and you shouldn't do that. It's, it's fine. I'm, you know, everybody has a way that they like to do it and I'm just going to share how I do it. And hopefully uh, we learn some stuff. Feel free to put suggestions and, and other tips that I don't talk about in the comments. And because I'm sure everyone will, will like to get more out of this, including me, I'm never afraid uh, to learn a little bit more about lake trout fishing. So let's get started here. I'm gonna talk about the equipment and the gear that I use. Uh, and by, by that, I mean, you know, the rods and, and lures and line and, and things like that. Some of the, some general, tips um, and tactics for finding and catching lake trout. And then I'll touch on a little bit of conservation. If you've been to one of my lake trout seminars before, you're gonna find a lot of this familiar because a lot of it doesn't change. Uh, and you'll know the conservation piece. If you already, if you already know the conservation piece at the end, um, just uh, hold, your, hold your answers for someone who, who may not know. Um, where we're gonna go with this. All right, quick, just a quick safety check. <laughs> I don't know if it's ever been more applicable than this, this year to be careful out there. There are some crazy ice conditions out there. Uh, we've been fishing out in the 19 mile day area and there should be a foot of ice out there and there isn't outside 19 mile bay in Moultonboro Bay area, there shouldn't. And Saturday we were looking at um, open water over by Kyle Island. So if, you, if you're in that area, do not venture out past Chase's Point because they don't believe it's safe. Although it probably will be after this cold snap that goes through. There isn't a lot of snow on the ice. So bring your spud bar if, if you're, you know, new, uh, heading out to a new place. Definitely, you know, check, make sure you're on, you're on good ice. You have those safety picks handy. There's some crazy conditions out there. I mean, we're seeing stuff going from nine inches to just a few inches and and you can find that rough jagged ice come across that rough jagged ice be really careful and proceed with caution because that's that's a place where it it was broken up and everything beyond that is going to be much much thinner so just be careful out there and and bring a throw rope those are three things that i would highly recommend that i have with me uh, i don't have a spud bar with me now just because i'm on the snowmobile and um, i'm not going anywhere new when I'm certainly walking out first time, I, I bring that spud bar. All right, so technology, cameras versus flashers. There, these are sometimes, this is sometimes what separates lake trout fishermen. Sometimes you have lake trout fishermen that fish with cameras and then you have lake trout fishermen that fish with flashers and some fish with both, but there's a very distinct set of two groups, uh, people that love cameras and people that love flashers. And I'll talk a little bit about um, me, I'm, I'm a flasher guy. I have a camera. Uh, I don't use it a ton, mostly because it takes me so long to get it set up that uh, I honestly don't have the patience for it. Um, I like it on the days that I take the time, the time to set my camera up. I absolutely love having it down there. This picture down here on the bottom, um, right down here uh, is, is from the Vexilar fish phone as a screenshot. And super fun to watch these fish come in, learn so much about lake trout by watching them on the camera. And the one example that I always share is during the derby, 
uh, several years ago, my friend John and I were, were fishing in this spot that um, turned out to be an amazing spot, but we found it just because it was so crowded and we had nowhere else we could find to fish. And we, we fished this, um, this break line. We had fish coming in nonstop, both of us, coming up on the Vexilar, chase the jig, and then they'd, they'd swim back down and they wouldn't eat. A friend of ours was up near Braun Bay fishing, and he fishes with a camera and chum, and he was watching them down there, and, and we called him while we were fishing, and he was describing to us that they were catching fish, but he learned by watching on the camera that if they moved the jig, the fish took off, and they had to drop it on the bottom, leave the, the jig on the bottom. They were fishing bucktails with, with sucker meat, and just twitch it on the bottom without actually lifting it off the bottom before he could even finish telling us that we had a fish on and we caught fish the entire rest of the day, day doing that. And I never would have known that if it wasn't for, for him with his camera. So they are an invaluable piece of, of equipment. It's just, if you, if you really want to move around a lot, the camera's definitely going to slow you down and the Vexilar will keep you moving uh, quicker and, and, and easier. Um, so for those of you new to flashers, you don't understand it. They, they pay, basically re relay all of this info. They'll tell you the depth. They can tell you, if you learn how to read it, the bottom composition. Most sonar flashers display in three colors, green, orange, and red. Green is a weak signal. Uh, orange is a medium strength signal. And red is a very strong signal. Your jig will usually show up as red. As a fish enters the cone, it'll, start, it'll come in as green, turn orange, and then turn red as it gets right underneath it and really strong returning signals will show up as red. So you can use that information to tell what kind of a bottom you have. If you have a really soft bottom, it'll be some red with some green on top of it, maybe some orange on top of it. That's kind of a soft bottom. Some weeds, if there's, there are some green lines above it, that's weeds. And if it's just a heavy red band, you know that you're on a hard bottom, which is, is pretty typical for lake trout. You can see the fish, they'll show up as a red line on the screen. So you know when they're there, you know when they're not. Uh, you can tell what depth they're at. You can tell the bite ceiling. So you can, I'll talk about bite ceiling further on in, in, this, in the presentation. And, you know, you can, lake trout will come off the bottom a, a certain distance every day. It's a little bit different every day based on a, a bunch of stuff they'll talk about later. And you can determine where that is because you can make the lake trout follow your jig and you can watch it on the screen and see at what point they turn around and go back down. Um, so that the depth of the fish, the mood of the fish, are they aggressive? Are they coming in slow? Um, we were, uh, I was out with a, a reporter and a photographer last night and we had fish coming in and off the lake trout coming off the bottom and they were just coming up real slow and sluggish. They weren't really hungry and um, really, it was really, they were super thick, finicky. Um, you can see a jig, how the fish reacts. It's like I say the mood of the fish and it's all real time. So flashes are, are really handy. And, and the advantage of a flasher over a camera is that transducer is only just below the bottom of the ice whereas a camera is all the way down, you know, 30 or 40 feet down. So with a flasher, you want to go to another hole, you just pick it up and move to the other hole. You don't have to pull all that cable in because it shoots straight down from the top. So I don't go on the ice without one of my Vexilars. You can also see bait fish or especially, uh, we see a lot of small perch and you'll see all these flickers on the bottom, right along the bottom. And I tell people if, if the bottom doesn't move, so if you see movement down there, flickering, flashing colors, then that's fish. And a lot of times the small perch will be down there and sometimes they'll come up to your jig and all of a sudden they'll split apart and one big red mark will be like three orange marks. And then you can get them to come, you know, three or four feet off bottom. They realize that they're too far off the bottom and they run right back down. Those, those small perch oftentimes drive my clients crazy because they are constantly fishing for those perch. And I, I ignore the perch but I like having them there because when a lake trout shows up, those perch will vanish. So if those perch are there and they all of a sudden just disappear, pay attention because they, that will tell you that there's a lake trout or sometimes a cusk in the area or eel pout for you Midwesterners. Uh, rod and reel setups. My favorite rod for a jigging lake trout is the 36 inch Ice Team Professional Series rod. Uh, just, it's, a, it's got a heavy backbone. It'll handle some big fish. Uh, I really love that rod. Um, but a more economical and equally as good rod is the 48, uh, 40 inch Dave again split handles. The so 40 inches, 40 inch rods are, if you're in a one man shelter and you're, you're inside, sometimes they get a little bit tough because uh, your hook sets, uh, you really want to get a good hook set on those fish and a 40 inch rod, if you're inside like a one, one man, uh, one of the smaller one mans that you may not have enough room and that 36 inch will, 
will be a little bit better for that. But those are my two favorite rods. I have a, a bunch of both of those. And I put the Clam Predator series reels on them. I like them. They have, you know, they use a really extreme low temperature grease and they're, they're it's a nice fishing reel. And I load those up with, with braid. Uh, people ask me all the time if I use bait casters. A lot of people do. They're very effective. I don't. I'm so used to spinning reels. Um, I, I'm so used to the sink rate and how quickly things get down there that I realize, I realize that I will actually do other things sometimes while my jig is sinking to the bottom because I know what I have time to do and what I don't if I'm in 30 or 40 feet of water. Or it's just, a, I'm just more used to them. I get a, a bait caster there and in my hand and I, I feel more foreign because I'm, I'm not as used to it. But a lot of people do run bait casters. Um, they make a lot of uh, bait cast rods. Clam makes a rod, the Jason Mitchell Mac series. They're designed for lake trout rods. They have bait caster uh, versions of that Mac rod as well. And those are really nice rods too. Just, uh, all right. Uh, my line, so I run 20 pound braid. This year I switched my braid to um, Daiwa J Braid X8 Grand. I, I love it. It's like thread. It's so soft. Uh, it seems to be holding up. I, I ran it in salt water too and it's held up really well. Um, against the abrasion. And then um, I'll run a piece of electrical tape or a couple wraps of, you know, four or five wraps of monofilament backing on the spool first before I put the braid on. And that just keeps the braid from spinning. You're in a nice warm house, you spool them up if you've never done this. Well, when that aluminum spool gets in the cold, it shrinks and the line will spin. And there's nothing worse than setting the hook on a, on a fish and reel, starting to reel. And all of a sudden you see all the line on your spool spinning. Um, so run a little piece of electrical tape, um, you know, just, just cut it wide enough. Just one wrap around is all you really need or a little bit of mono. Uh, I'm sure there'd be some other suggestions, things that people do to keep their braid from spinning. Some, a lot of spinning reels now will have a, a rubber center and that's, that's designed for, for braid to keep it from spinning. And then I run an eight pound fluorocarbon leader. Um, sometimes 10 pounds, not usually on, on Winnipesaukee. Eight's plenty. You know, if you get a 10 pound fish on eight pound fluorocarbon leader, you're gonna be able to land that fish if you, if you use the drag and you, know, you have a good drag and a good rod and you don't horse the fish and you keep the line off the edge of the ice, you're, you're gonna be fine. But I start out with about a six foot long eight pound fluorocarbon leader and they get shorter, lake trout, you know, the hungrier they are, the deeper they get the lures and they nick up the line. And, you know, you're, I'm constantly shortening my leaders. And so when they get down to about four feet, I'll lengthen them, I'll put new leaders on again and run it up to six feet, six-ish feet. I basically spread them, my arm span is, is about six feet. So I usually do one arm span for my, for my jigging rods. Don't run a swivel. I get this question all the time. And I should, but I don't. I don't run a swivel because, um, because being a guide, uh, even myself, it's in, in the heat of the moment, it's hard to remember if I'm in a hurry and I'm reeling in really fast to try to switch holes or switch rods, or if I have a fish on, I, I will reel that swivel up into my guides. And clients will especially, because a lot of them you know, are really uh, new to ice fishing. Some of them have never been ice fishing before. And they already have a lot to try to remember when I'm, you know, and standing in front of them barking orders as they're trying to fight a fish, um, you know, telling them things like don't lift the fish out of the hole by the line and don't reel the swivel into the rod. They totally forget that. And I don't blame them. So I don't run swivels. Um, the swivels, you reel it into the guides. If you have ceramic guides, it's going to chip the guides. If you don't have ceramic guides, that, that sudden stress will probably break your line and you'll lose a fish. So no swivels for me, my line gets twisted, yes. And I have probably 300 yards of line, 200, 200 yards of line on my spinning rods, the spinning reels. So if 30 feet of it gets twisted, I just take it off and, uh, and retie, tie my leader back on and I'm on fresh line and it's not twisted. You know, I'm not casting, so I'm not worried about if it gets a little bit low on the spool, I don't have to cast, it still comes off the spool just fine. And that's just, that's just my preference. I know a lot of people do run swivels and some people will run small swivels that you can reel through the guides. Um, every link in that line, every, every knot, every, you know, is a, is a potential breaking point on your line. And 
I have, I'll tell you when I stopped using swivels was that same year that I talked about the camera and the fish coming in and wouldn't, wouldn't bite unless we, if we lifted the jig off the bottom. About an hour before that, I set the hook on a fish that separated a ball bearing swivel. And I haven't used one since. So that has a lot to do with why I don't run swivels as well. All right, get into some lures. I'm going to just check in on these a little bit. On the comments, make sure nobody's panicking. There are no comments. Come on. Fifty. All right, my computer is not cooperating. I can't get to the comments. Try again. Sorry guys, I just want to make sure and see what's going on and my computer will not load the live feed. There we go. Got it. Okay. Um all right, yes, I have thoughts on tube jigs. I'll talk about those too. All right, so my favorite lures, Leech Flutter Spoon is one of my favorite lures for lake trout, for a lot of things. Uh, I love a quarter ounce uh, gold with the red dots or a purple and chartreuse glow. Gold with the red dots on a sunny day and I tend to lean towards that purple and chartreuse glow on a cloudy day. And you just jig them, you just rip them up and let them fall, this, this spoon, Best thing to do with any lure, any new lure that you've never fished, is drop it right in the hole where you can see it, or just a little ways down, especially on a lake like Winnipesaukee where the water's clear, so you can see it, see the action. And so you know when, when you do one thing, the lure does another. So you can kind of translate what that is. So when it gets down there, you know exactly what you're doing with that lure and learn how to control that lure. The leech flutter spoon is just, you rip them up and they lay on their side and they flutter down and they usually go off to an angle. And you'll notice if you're fishing with a flasher, the more you jig that lure, the, it'll eventually it'll disappear because it's worked its way out off out of the cone angle and if you just stop jigging for a minute it will slowly swing its way back in uh, that's one of my one of my favorites those quarter ounce um, whoops I forgot this is supposed to be the picture of the Tika minnow I don't know what happened to that picture but um, I uh, I love this Tika minnow you know, jigging wraps, shiver minnows, those types of lures have been around for a long time. And this is a solid one piece zinc alloy. I think from the beginning of time that I can remember fishing, the one complaint that I've heard about those types of lures is that the fins break off in your tackle box or when they hit the corner of the ice or draw, draw them and the, fin, the plastic fins break off. So these Tika minnows are, are zinc and they're one piece, so no fins to break, the fins there, but they won't break off. But I, I actually am becoming a big fan of the zinc because it fishes slower than lead. It sinks a little bit slower and they're a little bit bigger profile. So they fish a little bit slower, which, which I kind of like. Um, I, I think lake trout like that slow fall and they seem to come in and uh, pretty, pretty interested. My, my favorite color is the blue and silver halo just because it looks like a smelt. And that glow and purple tiger looks a lot like that purple and chartreuse glow leech flutter spoon. Uh, and that, that Tika minnow, you know, I, I spent more time with it this fall, past fall than I did this winter. And um, you can certainly rip it and let it swim out because it darts out to the side and, and let it swing in and dart out and swing in. But, you know, I got a lot of fish to bite this fall by just bouncing it like you would an ice fishing jig, bounce, 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 and work it up through the water column. But, just like anything, when they do come in, you can reel it away from them and, and they'll really, they really get excited over that when you just kind of keep it up, play that keep away game. 
Nervous Minnow from Daddy Mac, just, uh, the 1.4 ounce. You can fish the 2.8 if you have a rod, a nice fishing rod, you know, stout enough to handle it. But the 1.4 does a really good job. This was a picture was actually during the testing phase before it hit the market. Um, really popular lake trout lure. Uh, one of my favorites. Um, tricky to fish through the ice because you're straight down, there's no scope. So if you rip that lure and let it free fall, it has a tendency to, to foul hook. The, the hook will swing up and hook to your line and you have to reel it up and fix it. So my preferred method with, for jigging the nervous minnow is up fast and down slow. I basically, I, I rip it up and then I lower it down as fast as I can without dropping slack in the line. So I lower it down instead of just letting it free fall. And that seems to work pretty good. And when a fish comes in, I just, re I just keep it away from them. And, uh, and they love it, they eat them up. And the Whisperers, my signature series Whisperer. There's my good friend Rick Como with one on First Connecticut Lake on an orange jig head. And he was definitely the hot hand that day. He had that thing dialed in and, and he was doing two rips. So he, the only thing he was doing different, we were fishing the exact same thing and he'd rip, rip and let it fall. And they were just smashing it and didn't matter what I, they'd come in and look at mine and I was doing something different and then they'd swim over and he eat his. So uh, I like the white. Some people I've have told me that they've caught them on the pumpkin with red flake. I prefer white and clear water, uh, but they are infused with bioedge smelt oil. So there is some, some scent to them. And I know for a fact that Lake Trout will sniff, will smell lures. They come right in and bump them with their nose. I've watched them do it on camera. You can tell sometimes when they do it, when they're, when you're jigging, they'll just come in and, and bump it and they won't, they won't bite it. A lot of times they're, they're just kind of smelling it or not really tasting it, but smelling it. The Elite Ice from Daddy Mac, that's just a half ounce blade, similar to the Nervous Minnow without the joint. Uh, they work really well. Obviously there's, there's one that I got. I got several that day uh, on those. So you, lots and lots of choices. I like blue um, just because it's kind of smeltish looking and uh, that's the primary forage in Lake Winnipesaukee. Uh, so these, these lures are lead, the Elite Ice, is a half ounce so people might think it's not legal because of the lead band but it is it's con technically considered a spoon so sometimes you'll hear us refer to them as jigs and and they're not they're technically a spoon so they are legal in new hampshire waters well, what surprises we have here uh tubes somebody asked about tubes um berkeley power tubes and the havoc tubes the power tubes um seem to get scarce at times um three or four inch I started getting away from tubes when the lead band went into effect just because um, I hate the tin um, tube jig heads that you use inside the tube jig. They're just, they're big and they're not heavy enough for their size and, and I just, I don't like them. So I, I don't use them as much, but I do occasionally put one on because I'll tell you what, a white tube is a tubes of all sorts sizes depending on the size of the lake trout you're chasing and Winnipesaukee a, a three or four inch white tube is an extremely effective lake trout lure and you can fish them all kinds of ways you can rip them up and let them free fall you can slowly fl flutter them and just kind of make those those tentacles that are on the end they're just kind of flutter in the water a little bit and work them you know slowly up and down that's probably my favorite way to fish those uh, and give it a, an occasional rip every now and again just to get one's attention maybe from a distance and then that flutter usually on the flutter down they'll come in and, and smash it uh, just because it looks wounded and bucktails this wouldn't be a lake trout seminar from a new hampshire ice fisherman if i didn't mention bucktails fishing on lake Winnipesaukee. that's a staple it's still a staple uh, I know a lot of people are sad that AJ's closed. Um, it is now the Tackle Shack, so it, there is still a, a good bait shop in Meredith, but AJ's Bucktails are actually still available, and he makes non-lead ones, so you can buy those um, all over the place. You can buy them. I think the Tackle Shack has them. I know Barry's Bait has them. Um, so a, a bucktail with a strip of sucker belly, so I'll, we'll buy like a 14-inch sucker and fillet it, and I'll cut the white belly meat off, and we'll use that for bait and I just cut like a half inch by inch and a half or two inch strip of that white meat. I saved the, the dark skinned um, back meat and I cut that into a similar sizes and use that for chum. I'll talk a little bit about uh, chum as well. I'll hook that so it's skin side down 
Um, that's my preference, and that is a very effective lake trout lure. And then surprisingly, drop jigs, tiny tungsten jigs uh, in March, for some reason, mid-March on, these lake trout, you know, bugs are hatching, bugs are getting released from the ice. Lots, there's a lot of activity in the, in the bottom, and we are out chasing white perch. And I'll tell you, I'll put a blade spoon down there and catch a few lake trout maybe, but fishing on an epoxy drop with some maggots on it in mid-March or on in lake trout area, and they just just annihilate them. You can't, this, this was the day that um, Chuck Fritz and I, Mazzo Nacho, we were out chasing Lakers and, or chasing white perch and catching Lakers all day long, both of us. So it's a, believe it or not, a very effective um, lake trout lure. And now uh, I know Clam makes the drop XXL, which has a bigger hook, bigger, heavier hook on it. Because that was one problem that we were having this fish here. Uh, you can, you can't really see, maybe you can, but just hooked in the skin of the mouth. So you do lose a few fish. That skin is surprisingly tough, but that double XL drop jig really gets into that bone and, and give, if you can set the hook and get some good penetration and on their roof of their mouth and you, you'll land a lot of fish. All right. I'm gonna... All right. I'm just checking in here, Jeff Targ. I do use tip ups, and I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about tip up fishing here. Mm. All right, I'm going to keep moving on. So scouting. This used to be called the Navionics Web App. Um, you can see the screenshot. It's now long. It's now called the Navionics Chart Viewer. But if you go to Navionics.com and click on Chart Viewer you can pull up lake maps and it will be the same lake map that you have if you have a Navionics chip or if you have the Navionics app on your phone. It is the same map, same contours, same detail, and you can zoom in on that. You can use the sonar charts function, which gives you one foot increments on the depth, um, on the depths of the lake and you can really dial in some areas. So if you learn, if you, if you have a favorite kind of area, like if you love to fish on humps, you can go find humps from home, figure out if you, oh, let's go scout out a new area. It's always fun to, Chuck Fritz and I have done that many, many times, is sit down and look at, at this. Actually, we have a video on, on my YouTube channel that him and I filmed on First Connecticut Lake in Pittsburgh. And the night before, we went on and used the Navionics web app. And we talk about that in the video, how we used it and, and what areas we were looking for. And then when we get out there, so if you, if you really want to get into it, you can find areas that you want to go to on the web app. If you have the app on your phone, you can open the app on your phone, find those areas on your phone and drop pins. Um, if it's a lake like Onipisaki, you know, we'll kind of identify an area that we want to go to. And I have a, my, I put my Helix 9, the chart on my snowmobile and, and I can use that transfer waypoints if I want to. We know Winnie pretty well. So we know if we're going to a certain area, what we're looking for and we remember, you know, what kind of areas, but, um, that chart viewer is amazing. And it, it has contours for just about every, um, every lake, you know, six or eight years ago, there were a lot of places that didn't have any detail, but now thanks to sonar logging on people, people just out fishing can log their sonar and, and that data gets uploaded to Navionics if they choose to, and they'll use that data to update their maps. So you get a lot more um, current current data and updated data on, on certain water bodies. So it's a great scouting tool. This is what it looks like if you zoom in, you can see those one foot increments. It's just, there is some insane structure on this particular spot. You can see down in the corner here that sonar charts, you wanna click that, but it won't activate until you zoom in to a certain point. And then all of a sudden these, these all these depth contours will show up. And I mean, I don't know, I think you can see the cursor here. Oh, you know what, I think I can do a pointer. See if I can do a pointer. I think this is, yes, I do a laser pointer. Look at that. I feel so accomplished. Um, these humps right here, you know, surrounded by deep water, they're 
know, some of these are coming up 70 feet, 80 feet, surrounded by 130. Then you have this one over here that's 50 feet, surrounded by all this deep water. Those are just, they look like money spots. And, you know, I could be wrong, but boy, do they look like good places. Uh, and I'll talk a lot about these areas. These shelves have become a really, really, really top priority favorite place of mine to fish for lake trout. Any shelves like this one here is kind of an inside turn, little shelf. This one here. Um, this shelf here on the edge of that hump, this one here. Uh, I love fishing places like that. It seems like these lake trout will come up and cruise on and, and, and often just like they do on the humps. Um, so I love those. So yeah, you can zoom in for that, that chart feature. Um, you can do a lot of planning too. You can use this root, this compass down here. You click that and it will give you two points and you can drag those anywhere and it will tell you the distance from, from I think that's like purple and red and it'll tell you how far away things are. So this can be deceiving. If you were out there on foot, you can do the same thing on the app. And you can tell if you're walking, you know, things don't always look very far away. And then you look, pull it up on here and it's a mile and a half. And um, it's better to know ahead of time what you're getting yourself into because you gotta go mile and a half out, you're gonna go a mile and a half back. All right, we're gonna get into some tips. Um, all right, I'm gonna cover a couple of these questions. Um, Greg uh, Wainer, I'm gonna hope I didn't pronounce that horribly. Ask what size bucktail jigs. Um, I like a half ounce. I know a lot of people like a one ounce. They like a bigger one. You know, they're probably hoping for um, bigger fish obviously, but I've caught a lot of fish on a half ounce bucktail in Lake Winnipesaukee. And I think it's gonna be relative to where you go. If you go to a place that has an average, a larger average size, and I would probably use a larger bucktail. But for Winnipesaukee or Squam or Winnesquam, I think uh, a half ounce is a pretty safe bet. But like I said, I, I know a lot of people that use um, one ounce bucktails. And James asked if I have any advice for people that don't have flashers. I do. My best advice to people that don't have flashers is buy a flasher. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just kidding sort of. Uh, if, if you don't want a flasher or can't afford a flasher, or can't justify the expense, um, do it you know, like we did before. I haven't always fished with a flasher. I mean, I've only fished with a flasher since, um, I don't know, probably 15 years now. 06, I think I bought my first flasher, 05 or 06, maybe a little before that. And, and before that, we, we just, we fished the water column. So drop all the way to the bottom and fish the bottom couple of feet for a little while and then come up from there and fish a couple of feet. And I'll talk a little bit about pounding bottom, which is a, a great technique. And uh, I will say that you, you develop, I think you develop a little bit better feel for the bites when you're not staring at a flasher because you're more in tune to what you're feeling. It's all you have is, is what you feel. As opposed to with a flasher, it really takes a long time to, to get used to seeing a fish come in on the flasher and taking your eyes off the flasher. A lot of times I will fish with my rod tip right in front of the screen of the flasher so I can see them both and I don't have to look away. But paying, taking the, your focus off the flasher and, and putting your, your focus and your attention on the, on the rod. So without a flasher, yeah, just fish the water column. I, I always used to fish it three feet at a time. I'd fish the bottom three feet, you know, jigging up three feet and I'd reel up three feet or if you know the retrieve on your reel, the number of crank, inches per crank, you can, you can count cranks um, and just fish the entire water column. Yeah, there are a lot of affordable flashers. Somebody's just talking there. Uh, a lot of companies make affordable flashers. Uh, you know, Vexilar's base flasher is, is 300. You can probably get into other flashers uh, for less money, but um, I will say, uh, shameless plug or, or whatever, the, those, the reason that I fish Vexilar flashes is because they have the lowest failure rate in the industry. They just don't break. Um, they, they really don't. You replace batteries and that's it. My original flasher is still going and it's just had a few new batteries and, and that's it. They just don't break. There's no software updates, none of that. But if, if you can't afford one and you can get a deal on something a little more basic, then uh, I'll, I'll tell you, you fish with one, it will ruin your fishing. You'll, you'll, you'll never want to fish without it again. I, I have clients that sometimes I think I have five now and if I have a big group and they have to share them, 
the person that's fishing with a flasher and gives it up to somebody else to use will nine times out of 10 stop fishing until they get it back. Uh, it's just, it's, you know, it changes things, gives you a kind of a, a look down there. Um, boy, a lot of questions coming in. Do I often find them close enough to public access? Oh yeah, Joe, Musiac, sorry if I'm butchering names, I'm doing my best. Um, there is a ton of places to catch Lake Toad on Lake Winnipesaukee that within walking distance. Um, most of the public accesses, um, short of like States Landing, Swissvale area, there aren't very many lake trout up in that area. Any other part of the lake, if you can get to a public access, you can walk out to, if you can get into, you know, 30 feet of water, and near, you know, inside turns or drop-offs or humps. And I'll, I'll talk about all that stuff in a minute here. Plenty of places. People walk out and catch lake trout in Alton Bay. People walk out and catch lake trout on 19 Mile Bay, off of Alakoya when it's safe. Uh, Brewster Beach is off that is a really good spot for lake trout. Um, these are all well-known places. So I'm, they're state park and public access. These are you know, so I'm not like spot burning here. I'm, I'm, you can find it's this information anywhere. Um, but yeah, if you can walk onto the lake, Winnipesaukee, you can probably find places to catch lake trout. Um, there was one other. Question, the shallowest. Well, I, I don't fish um for lake trout in under 25 feet most of the time but however i have a friend in colorado that catches giants in granby uh, his name's bernie keith and he is a an avid passionate lake trout fisherman and he catches 40 inch fish in eight feet of water and it's a different fishery it's a different um region so there is a lot that's different different food uh, forage base but his theory he's told me over the years is that lake trout don't spend a lot of time in eight feet of water, but when they do go into eight feet of water, they're only there for one reason and it's to eat. And a um, couple of years ago, I talked to some guys that were fishing on Great East Lake for rainbows in super shallow water, um, under eight feet of water. And they were catching five to seven pound lake trout up in that shallow water on their, on their rainbow trout tip ups. Um, those fish were, those big fish were coming in there. Uh, looking for food so it's certainly you know they they do venture into shallow water my first lake trout ice out lake trout last year in my kayak was in eight feet of water so and that was there was still some ice floating around on parts of the lake so they will they will go shallow uh, I'll focus on on where I target them here in a minute but that's that um, Okay, somebody lost my sound. Uh, other people have it, so hopefully Bob Morissette, you can get your sound back. Let's just do a quick check. Everybody else have sound? Um, all right. Okay, moving on. So some tips. Stay mobile. Uh, mobility is oftentimes the key but not the rule of law. I will, I will say that there are days um, where I won't move around for lake trout. And there are a lot of reasons why, and I'll get into, I'll get into some of those reasons here. Good on the sound. Okay. Thanks everyone. Um, but mobility is often, all right, people are blowing up the phone. Uh, Okay. Let's see, questions coming in on Messenger. Um, so, um, you know, stay mobile. I'm not sure why I ended up with a picture of a white perch in there. Sorry about that. <laughs> but you'll catch those too in, this, in a lot of the same places. Uh, be efficient, make it easy to move. You keep all your stuff put away instead of spread out all over the place if, if you want to move. And, uh, and stay flexible because things can change on a dime. We started out this morning, had a, I had a group of, on the ice and we started out really, really slow and didn't think anything was gonna happen really. And then, and then bang, bang, it, it kind of all happened at once. So 
you got to be got to be flexible and, and willing to move. And some days the fish are on humps, some days they're they're cruising brake lines or you know drop offs, and sometimes they're on inside turns, and sometimes they're picky, sometimes they're hungry. You really got to be able to kind of um, stay flexible. And and the most important thing that I'll, I will tell you uh, about lake trout fishing is to make sure that you're having fun. Some of the things that I do might not be fun for you, so. Try them. If you don't like them, don't do them because they're certainly not worth ruining a good time on the ice. Some people like to be more social and just hang out and fish tip ups and throw some chum down and, and, and shoot the breeze. And that's perfectly fine. Keep it easy. Dave Gens has preached for years that if it's, if it's easy, you'll do it. And that's, he's, he's right. Uh, if dishes were easier, I'm sure many of you guys can relate and, and agree that we would do a lot more dishes if they were easier. Uh, moving, um, tying on new lures. So do things like, you know, keeping your gear put away, um, fish with multiple rods if you can afford it and have a different lure on every rod. I, I go out with, uh, when I'm lake trout fishing, I'll have a rod pre-rigged with a quarter ounce bleach flutter spoon. I'll have one with a Tika minnow on it. Um, sometimes one with a tube or, um, you know, one of my other favorite lures. So I, if I want to switch, I don't have to retie. I don't have to worry if my fingers get cold, I can just go grab another rod and, and fish that rod. So keep it easy. Moving, mobility, if it's easy, you'll move more often. The harder it is to move, the less often you're going to move. But uh, mobility allows you to locate more fish. You're putting your lure in front of more fish on days when they're finicky. You know, Bernie Keith, my friend in Colorado, says the same thing, that lake trout are definitive. And it lake, he believes that a lake trout makes up its mind whether or not it's going to eat your lure within seconds after it sees it. If it doesn't come in and smash it, because his point is you have to do everything right. And if they don't smash it right away, then you start all over again and you, and you have to really convince that fish to come in and bite. So sometimes for me, you, I'll have a fish that keeps coming in and won't bite and I cannot get that fish to bite. And some days I'll just move. I'll make a, a big move and I'll go somewhere else and I'll target, target some other fish. And it doesn't mean I won't come back because those fish will kind of habituate the same area for a long period of time. They'll cruise around looking for food in the, in the same area sometimes for hours. It doesn't mean I won't come back and drop down on them again and try to get that fish to bite. And oftentimes the second time they see it, they'll, they'll actually hit it. Yeah, this fish just aren't biting. That was something my dad used to say. Like he'd say, let's go home. The fish just aren't biting. Um, and a lot of time they're just not active, actively seeking for seeking food. But if you can get the right lure in front of them presented the right way, if it's easy for them, they'll do it. That's the thing in the wintertime. If, if they can, can eat something that looks like food, if you can fool them and make it easy for them to eat it, then sometimes they will when they ordinarily wouldn't swim halfway across the lake just for your, for your lure. Um, efficiency, this is kind of what I was saying, you know, put your stuff away, you know, when you're, when you're done, so make it easy to move. The less time you spend messing around, putting stuff away, the more time you spend fishing and the easier it is, it is to move. So efficiency has all kinds of, um, benefits in, in, you know, how quickly and easily you can move. Uh, but also how much time you spend with your, with your rod in your hand, as opposed to putting it down, trying to do something else. Uh, one of my favorite techniques for catching lake trout is to eat a sandwich. Never fails. Get a sandwich out with no place to put it, and a fish will come in and bite it. My dad used to say this about, about fishing. Uh, it's like playing pool. Every time you hit that, that cue ball, you're, you're not thinking about the ball it's going to hit. You're thinking about what's going to happen after it hits, the next move, one move, and, and you're, you're trying to position things so much, so much, uh, so just so that you can. Uh, try to anticipate the next move and, and set yourself up. So always think ahead. That was, that was his motto. Always think ahead. You know, if I know where I'm going, I know where I'm going after that. If I, if I plan on moving, um, and, uh, what color am I going to switch to? What lure am I going to switch to? And this is generally the order of what I will change. So I change color first, then I'll change my lure. Then I'll change my spot. Um, same thing with gear. If you take it out, put it away. When I was a uh, younger man, I would go out fishing and I'd spread all my stuff out 
it looked so efficient. It was right there where I could get it. My skimmer was right there if I needed it. My bait was right here. My rod bag was right here. My tackle, like everything was, was laid out neatly and it looked very efficient. And it was until it was time to move. And I'd pick it all up and I'd put it all back in my sled where it went. And then I'd get to my next spot and I'd spread it all out again. And then I want to move. So this time I wouldn't put it all away as neat and just throw it in the sled and I'd move again. I'd spread it all out. And then if, if I managed to do it a third time, I would uh, eventually just give up because I got sick and tired of picking up all my stuff. So now you, you rarely see anything on the ice when I'm fishing, especially when I'm alone, other than my Vexilar and, and a rod. Sometimes I'll lay a rod bag down, but most of the time I put it back where it goes. I put my auger back on the rack. I put everything back, you know, if I'm, if I'm on foot back in my, in my fish trap and, and uh, try to keep things neat and more mobile. This is a question that's been coming up the last couple of years uh, because there are a lot of times when I'm guiding that and fishing that I won't move. I will stay in one spot. We had a long discussion about this today while I was guiding this group of clients, um, just talking about some past experiences. And uh, I'm sorry, there's some messages and stuff coming in. I just wanna keep up with everything here. Um, Brad LaJoy, I'm not, I haven't seen your comment. It should be in the same video. I might've just missed it, but I'll, if I don't answer it now, I will get back to you on it. I'll, I'll go through the comments later. Um, so a lot of things determine what, whether you're going to move, right? Your mood and your goal. What are you hoping to accomplish? Are you out there just to hang out and relax? There are some days when I, you know, when I get a chance to fish, especially like last winter, I was, you know, sometimes six days in a row. And when I did get a chance to fish, I wasn't really that concerned with catching. I really just wanted to be able to sit and, and relax and uh, just, you know, not have to focus on anything. Other days I get out there and I just, I'm the only reason I'm there is to, to try to catch as many lake trout as I possibly can and try to learn some new techniques and, and things like that are you being so are you being social are you more concerned with catching fish um, and then it also depends on the fish and um, how active they are you know if if you're not seeing any fish on your fish finder if you have a if you have a fish finder if you have tip-ups that are out and you've adjusted your depths and you've checked your bait and your bait is alive and your leaders are long and in good shape then and you're not having any flags uh, that might be a reason that you want to move. Um, but uh, weather might keep you from moving. Uh, high winds, you know, you might get into a spot that's kind of blocking the wind. Uh, there aren't very many places on, on, on the lake where you can get out of the wind and fish for lake trout. Lots of places you can get out of the wind, but some of those places are in super shallow water and they're just, you know, weedy and there might not be many fish in there. Um, the number of people that you have with you, if it's harder to move around, you, you, you're not gonna move as much. Um, the amount of gear you have and whether you have a snowmobile or an ATV and your ability to, to make you know, bigger moves um, and the number of people that are on the ice. Um, one thing that I do, especially when I'm guiding is I pay attention to everyone around me, everyone I can see. I've even thought about bringing binoculars out there so I can watch people, not because I wanna run over there and catch fish, I just wanna know. Um, I'm not a perfect lake trout fisherman and, and I have off days when I just can't seem to do anything right. And if somebody else is catching fish, then I wanna know that it's me. And then I'm more likely to, all right, let's get out of here. They must not be in here, we're not marking fish, we're not catching them, somebody else is catching fish. But I've had days where we, we can see 30 people, you know, groups all over the place. And I have friends that are out on snowmobiles tooling around, uh, running and gunning, looking for fish. And, you know, they're texting me updates on what they're finding. And we have days, you know, we're surrounded by people and it's fishing is just super slow. And I don't see anybody catching fish. There's no point in moving around. You can if you want to change the scenery. But for me, when I have lots of clients and gear, to move, it just doesn't always make sense when everybody else is moving for me. If everybody around me is not catching fish, 
uh, and people that are out running and gunning, it's just a slow day. It might be a high pressure, sunny, bright, sunny day, which bright sun kills the lake trout fishing most of the time. So if people, if nobody else is catching and, no, and, and other people are moving around and they're not catching, then maybe you just enjoy the day. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong and, and you, you'll go out and catch fish anyway. Uh, I'm just going to check in. Okay. I'm going to keep moving and I'll, I'll get back to the questions and scroll through them and, and answer as many as I can after. Uh, this is, goes along with, with efficiency, eliminating those unnecessary steps like, you know, um, like uh, tying lures on ahead of time. So you don't have to switch rods. You don't have to switch lures. And these are little things that, um, you know, aren't, aren't the most important thing in the world, but the little things do add up. So there is, there is a sum to all the parts. So if you put enough little things together, especially like time savers, you can save yourself a lot of time. Um, things, a lot of little things to make things easier. You've made things a lot easier when you put a lot of little things together. So it does, it does help. And, and I find it fun. I'm always trying to find ways to make things easier or um, simpler or more efficient. But the less time you spend messing around with the gear, the more time you can fish. You know, my dad always used to say, if your line's not in the water, you can't catch a fish. So the more time you have to spend with your lines in the water, uh, the better your chances are of, of catching fish. And like I said earlier, plan ahead. All right, some techniques. Fish for those biters. On, on days when the fish are really active and you have a lot of fish coming in, there are, it's very, very common for lake trout. If you have a vexilar, you can watch those fish come off the bottom. It's, and it's very common, on, especially on like bright sunny days where those fish will just come flying off the bottom and get right to your lure. And they come off the bottom with such conviction that I know at that moment that that fish is going to bite and hold my breath ready for it to bite and they'll stop and swim back down. And two minutes later, it comes right back in again. It does the same thing. And I hold my breath and it doesn't bite. I, do, I think I do everything right. I keep it away. The next time I won't keep it away and I'll just keep it moving right there where they can hit it. And some days you can't get them to bite. And eventually I'll just leave those fish. If they're active, I'm going to leave them. I'm going to go find fish that haven't been looking at my lure for the last hour. And I'm going to try it on them and, and hope that, and it usually that's the, you know, that's where, where it, uh, I see the benefits is just getting away from those fish. And I don't know if it's them or me. It's just a fresh, a clear head and no frustration because I'm starting over on new fish. It's like a reset button. Um, I think it's probably a little bit of both. So Lake Trout Definitive, that's what I was saying earlier that, you know, they decide pretty quickly whether or not they're going to bite your lure. As soon as they see it, they come in, they're either coming in to eat it or coming in to try to chase it. And uh, there, those are two very different things. We can chum in New Hampshire. I don't know a lot of other states, they don't allow it, but New Hampshire does allow chumming. So I talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, over chumming is a huge problem. Chumming is a very, very effective for getting fish to come in. Uh, very, very effective. Um, the very few times that I've dropped two or three pieces of chum down a hole and not had a fish come in within 15 minutes. Sometimes before the, the last piece of chum even hits the bottom, there's a fish already coming in to look. And it works so well that as soon as that fish comes in, if it doesn't bite, my clients will say, throw more chum down there. Every time you throw chum down there, a fish comes in. I'm like, yeah, well, he's coming, he's eating the chum and he's getting full. And eventually what point is there for that fish to chase your lure when there's free chum floating down every five seconds? So I put two or three pieces down there. I give it a half hour or so to work. If I can't get a fish to bite, uh, I, I'll move to another spot and, uh, and try to get, you know, fish for those biters, like I said earlier. And pounding bottom, I talked about that when I was talking about not having a flasher or a fish finder. Pounding bottom gets the fish to come in. You know, a lot of fish like perch will hide in the, trying to dig themselves into the bottom to hide from the lake trout, um, bugs, things like that. Lake trout will eat bugs. So they pound the bottom, you know, rip it up a foot or two and let it hit the bottom really hard and, and pound that bottom a few times and then reel it up a foot or two and, and jig. And that often gets lake trout to come in. 
these are techniques that we use on Winnipesaukee. So maybe this doesn't, isn't going to work, you know, in other parts of the country where I haven't fished for them, but these are techniques that are, are proven. Most of this stuff I learned from other people uh, that were gracious enough to, you know, to teach me over the years. And some stuff I found, I learned on my own, some techniques I've just kind of picked up along the way. The bite ceiling, how far off the bottom those fish will go. They will chase a lure. If, you know, I just keep reeling it when they come, when they come in and, you know, maybe I'm bouncing it, but just reel it away from them and they'll come up just so high and then they'll turn around and go back down. And when they're really active, you get, you get examples of that over and over and over again throughout the day. And you'll find it's almost always the same. Every time those fish come in that day, that bite ceiling is going to be almost the same and they turn around to go back down. The reason that that's good to know is because if the bite ceiling is eight feet off bottom and you're working that jig up to 15 feet off bottom, you're wasting a ton of time because the fish aren't going to come up there. So if you get to that eight foot, eight foot point, maybe a foot past it, if they don't bite, drop it right back down to the bottom and, and work that work that area under the bite ceiling and, and don't really bother going any higher than that. And then every once in a while you can rip it up and you'll, you'll get a fish that's really excited and it will, it will chase it up and hit it. And in some places that is a, a, a popular technique to just just uh, scream that bait up off the bottom and, and make them chase it. And then set that hook. Now, 40 inch split handle is a good lake trout rod because it's stout and has a lot of backbone. The roof of a lake trout's mouth is solid bone and it's really important to get a good hook set because they have really big head shakes and, and a, a heavier lure like a one ounce bucktail, they'll get that thing swinging around. And if there's any slack, They'll, they'll throw that right out of their mouth. So a, a good hook set is, is really important right from the beginning. Uh, I thought there was another one about keeping the line tight. Maybe I've mixed these slides up. So I'm just gonna scroll through here. Um, oh, all right. Answering questions without even them asking. Let's see, 10 new comments. Um, I do eat lake trout. I have preached for years how they don't taste very good and if they're not properly taken care of, they don't. Uh, my girlfriend asked me to bring them home this summer or fall because she'd never eaten one and she hears me say that they're not good and she wanted to try one. So I was adamant that I was going to bleed that fish and then when I filleted it, you can see along the edges of the fillet the, a lighter, almost whitish um, meat because the meat's very orange, and that's the fatty meat. And I, I trimmed that off, and I trimmed out the, the pin bones as many of them as I could, and uh, fried it. And it was delicious. I couldn't believe it. I've told people for years that they taste like fish slime rolled in mud, uh, mud rolled in fish slime, and then fried. And um, if you don't properly take care of them, I, I think they do, but they're a great smoking fish. They're, they're good fried. Um, so um, I do like them. They're not my favorite. I'd prefer a white perch over a lake trout any day, but I know, you know, if, if I kill one, I'm going to bring it home and eat it. And, and I'm not going to be sad about it anymore that I have to eat, choke down that lake trout. It's all about how you prepare them. Um, Somebody's asking for about a lake with steep sides and deep depths, like third lake, no humps or real structure. I just fish those edges and um, just fish those steep sides. And, you know, I get into around 30 feet of water. And all the, the tricky part when you're fishing with a, with a flasher or most fish finders is it's going to show you a bottom on the first place that that cone hits. So if you're, if you're fishing an edge, and your cone comes down and it hits here, it's gonna show you your bottom up here. So you'll notice on your flasher, when you drop your lure, it's, it, it'll hit the, what looks like the bottom on the flasher, but it will keep falling, depending on how steep it is, because the flasher is only showing you the first edge that it hits. So there's more down here. And a lot of times those fish will be coming up. You'll, they'll come up out of the bottom and they'll, and they'll hit it. So, you know, fish around around 30 feet on those steep edges. And if there are any kinds of contours, you know, along, along that edge, um, let me go like this. 
Um, any places where it comes in or out and forms an inside turn like this here, that's a place that I would probably um, start anyway on that edge, you know, on some sort of an inside turn. Um, I do eat lake trout. Mobility is a negative to help hub shelters. It can be. Um, if you practice setting up a hub, I can get, I have the, the X600, six sided, it's 12 feet across. I can get that thing set up in about 60, out of, once it's out of the bag, I can have it set up in about 60 seconds, even in the wind. Um, I'll take one of the hub lines, put an anchor in and, and hook that hub line, pop a hub open and hook it on the anchor so it doesn't blow away. And then I can set up the rest of the shelter. But yeah, it is, it is more work to set up a hub versus like a fish trap or a, a flip over. Um, but it really depends on, you know, I mean, if, if you can only afford to have one shelter, then you pick the one you think you'll use the most. If you, if you have more of it, more often have a use for a hub shelter, then buy the hubs and, and just practice setting it up. I know a lot of people that fish in hubs, they're usually uh, more affordable, I think for the most part. So I know a lot of people that fish in hubs and they fish pretty successfully and, and they'll, you know, they'll move them around. You don't have to put it back in the bag. If you're making a quick move, you can just pop it down, throw it in your sled and go to the next place and pop it up. Uh, so you don't have to put it all away. So it doesn't have to be a, a deterrent to, uh, to moving. Um, a lot of cookie cutters and fish and yep. Mark, Sam is working in the other room. She is a, uh, just got a promotion. So they, uh, she's working hard. Joe, this will stay public. It'll be up here. You can watch it anytime you want. It'll also be on, I'm going to upload it to YouTube. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, Adrian. Yep. Great fish on Winnie. Alan Kimball. I am the, my next webinar coming up is going to be on white perch. That's coming up in a couple of weeks, I believe. Actually, let me tell you right now, because I have it in my calendar. Um, my white perch seminar is on February 11th, right before the Derby. Maybe I should have done it after the Derby. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, dun, 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 tip up advice is coming, Ben, here in just a minute. Mm -mm -mm. The average sized laker on Winnie, um, I would say three to four pounds is the, the kind of the cookie cutter on Winnipesaukee, you know, 20 inches, I think is, we don't catch very many, especially through the ice that are under 18 inches. So there's an 18 inch minimum to be able to keep them. Uh, and, and we, we don't uh, catch a, a lot of them. There are a lot of small ones in there, but cookie cutters, average size is probably, I would say maybe four pounds. There are some big fish in that lake. The biggest fish, the biggest lake trout I've taken out of there is eight pounds. Um, I caught one that was 29 inches long, but it was um, really at the end of its life and it had a big, great big head and super skinny body. It was, I think it was definitely dying or on its way out. Um, Rob, Camacho, chum pots are very popular. Uh, a lot of people will fish chum pots. Um, People put all sorts of different things in them. Some people will buy the smelted dye from the bait shop and, and mush that up and put it in there. Some people put cat food in there. Some people put tuna fish is a popular one that, that we used to use when I fished with my dad. Um, Brad is asking what size sled I use. Um, if I'm on, so I, see, I have fish traps. So I have the big fish trap that I pull behind my snowmobile when I'm on foot. I bring my, my one man, I have a, a scout uh, or a legend XL and I'll, I'll bring that out. No, it's a scout XL and I bring that, but for, as for a jet sled, usually it's just the regular, um, the medium size jet sled, not the, not the huge one. Um, but it depends on, on how big your shelter and how much gear you want to bring. Dun, 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 dun. All right. There are a lot of questions coming in. Good options for big Lakers in the U.S. There are a lot of options for big Lakers in the U.S. Um, Lake Champlain, go to Lake Champlain. Um, I know 
Um, I, my buddy Matt Trombley is guiding ice fishermen up there, third alarm charters. Don't know if he's targeting lake trout through the ice, but we catch some big lake trout up there in the summertime. Um, my biggest up there this summer was 13 pounds, um, 30, I think it was 35 inches long. So there are some big fish there. Granby in Colorado, go see Bernie Keith uh, fishing with Bernie. He is regularly catching 30 and 40 inch lake trout uh, in that lake and they have lots of small ones too. Um, there, are, there are a lot of places in the U.S. to catch big lake trout. Um, there are some lakes in Minnesota that I can't remember the name of off the top of my head that northern lakes that have some, I've seen some pictures recently of some big lake trout. I know, um, uh, uh, what's um, in Montana? I don't know if Flathead has them, but um, Fort Peck has some really good lake trout fishing in it. Uh, the Great Lakes, if you can get on them. Um, go see uh, Tommy Hicks. He targets big lake trout on uh, Lake Superior, I believe. They catch some big lakers there. So uh, look up Tommy Hicks, um, Beyond the Catch Guide Service. These are all friends of mine. So um, top-notch guides and, and they're, on, they're on big fish. I will explain inside and outside turns here in just a minute when I get through this this stuff here. Um, I don't, Jed Bailey, I don't, I don't pay as much attention as I probably should to moon phases. I know a lot of people that do, and I do think there is something to it. I just don't pay as much attention to it. It's not a habit for me, so it's really hard for me to form new habits. I do feel that high and low pressure fronts affect the fishing, especially lake trout. Uh, a bright, sunny, high pressure day, I will, uh, if I'm fishing, I, will, I won't even bother targeting lake trout on a high pressure, bright bluebird sky day. Uh, it's just 90% of the time, it's super tough fishing and I, it's just really, really tough. So uh, I like low or falling pressure for lake trout. Um, I don't like sun and wind really at all for ice fishing. Um, thanks, Mark. I'll, I'll tell her. Let's see. Um, and 12 split, 12 feet in the middle of the lake, 85, 90 all around. Um, if you, Anthony, if you have a fish finder and you're, and you're marking fish, but not catching them, um, then it's what you're using or how you're using it. If you're not really marking fish on a fish finder, try moving down into a little bit deeper water instead of being right on top of the hump fish down in, you know, maybe 20, 20 to 30 feet or even 40 feet on the edge of that deep water. But I guarantee there are some fish cruising up on that hump or at least, at least around it um, to look for bait. There are a lot of comments. So I, th I think I'm just going to move on. I'm going to get through this and then I'm going to go through and answer as, as many of the questions as I can. So I fish a lot of humps, what I was just saying. I like to fish humps that are 20 to 30 feet with 40 to 60 or more feet of water around them. Like this is a series of of three humps here, 19, 21, and 27 feet. Really good spot. This is deeper water down here. These fish will come up out of this deep water onto these humps looking for bait that's hiding up there, small yellow perch or um, schools of smelt maybe, but typically small yellow perch or whatever might be up there hiding on those humps. Um, breaks, which is just a drop off, basically a sharp, a steep drop off a ledge Break lines are really good places. Um, the fish will kind of um, either push bait into them or they'll, they'll cruise into these breaks and along these breaks to um, get from one spot to another. You know, fish generally based on the pressure, the barometric pressure, um, they, don't, they don't go over things as much as they do around. And so if they wanna be in 25 feet of water, they'll follow the contours around and then you get into these break lines, um, you know, steep drop offs like this. And, this is, this is a, a place that's, uh, that I really like to fish because it's kind of an inside turn, but the way that it drops off and, and the, the way that these sections peel off like this, they kind of form this almost imaginary break line right here. And this is a phenomenal area for me to catch lake trout. I have really good luck in places like that. There are several of them on Lake Winnipesaukee and you can find them by studying that Navionics map. Um, I, I must have deleted a slide. So James was asking about inside and outside turns. An inside turn, I tell people, is just 
at like an underwater cove and an outside turn is like an underwater point. So this would be an inside turn right here because it comes inside and then back out again. Uh, this would be an outside turn. So it looks kind of like a point. So those are inside and outside turns, both, both good places to, to target. Lake trout will push um, bait into here. And you catch a lot of white perch in there. Inside turns are one of my favorite places to catch white perch as well, which will also be in similar areas. And I, I will add when, when I bring setups for lake trout, I also have rods that are rigged and ready for white perch because a lot of times when you're lake trout fishing, the white perch will move in and they'll chase a bigger lake trout lure, but sometimes they won't eat it. And you have to downsize to a, you know, like an eight ounce blade spoon and, and have it ready so that when those fish do show up, I can real burn my, my lure to the top and drop that white perch lure down in there. It's just a, a little uh, extra nugget. So there are two, you're, you're working with two factors here, the triggering factor and the predatory factor. The predatory factor is when those fish are just looking to get, food in their mouths, you know, or, or they're just um, hungry and they're feeding. When they're not hungry, how do you get them to bite? You have to figure out what that triggering factor is. And the triggering factor is a technique. Um, it could be a, a quick rip. It could be burning the lure to the top. It could be bouncing it on the bottom and just leaving it down there and, and bouncing it along on the bottom a little bit, stirring up a little bit of silt and then leaving it. It could be a dead stick. Something's going to trigger those fish when they see it to bite, even when they're not hungry. And, and that's um, a, a really, really valuable thing to learn. And you have to relearn it every time you go out. Sometimes it, it's usually different by the day, but learning what, what's going to snap those fish out of that chase mode and, and put them into bite mode is the triggering factor. Uh, here we go. Keep your line tight. Um, lake trout have big, big head shakes. And if you, if you fish in Lake Winnipesaukee in clear water and you watch Lake trout, when they come up, whether it's in the, in the summer jigging them or in the winter jigging them, lake trout, when they shake their head, they literally look like somebody's holding them by the tail and they're just shaking their entire body. It looks, that's what it looks like when they do it. They just throw their head. And if you don't keep your line tight, they'll open up a hole where that jig is hooked in them and, and they'll throw that jig right out of their mouth. Uh, they have really big head shakes and the bigger they are, the bigger the head shakes. So keep that line tight. And tip ups. Somebody was asking about tip-ups. Um, all right, I got to inside and outside turns. I hope that answers that, that question for you guys. I generally don't fish tip-ups when I'm alone, but I fish tip-ups when I'm guiding because they catch a lot of fish. Um, it's not my preferred technique. I like to fish, especially for lake trout. I like to jig. I like to feel the bite and I like to set the hook. I like that cat and mouse game. I like all that. But when my clients are coming and they, and they want to catch fish, some of them say I'd rather just jig and we'll just jig. But I do put tip ups out because they work really well. And there are days on Lake Winnipesaukee when a lake, when the lake trout will not even react to a jig, but they'll eat live smelt all day long. So we bring the tip ups, we bring the smelt. And that is all I use on Lake Winnipesaukee is smelt. If the bait shop doesn't have smelt, I buy a sucker and we jig and chum. And I won't, I just, I won't fish shiners on Winnipesaukee. Last year, I had a big group of people on the ice. There was another big group of people that were really close to us. They were so close that um, people that drove by thought we were one big group. And they had one flag all day. And my group caught fish all day long and they, came over to me after my group had gone home and I was cleaning up all my stuff and asked me if I could lend any advice to help them because they had suffered throughout that entire day watching us catch fish and they only had one flag with nothing on it. And I, I just asked him what they were using for bait and he said emeralds. And then that was it. I, I spent the extra money on smelt. We caught fish all day. They bought emeralds and they caught nothing. So not that you'll catch nothing on shiners, but you're going to catch a lot more fish on smelt in Lake Winnipesaukee because that is the primary forage and it's it's they will they will single out smelt because the benefit the the energy benefit is much higher from a smelt than it will be from like a yellow perch or or you know or something else they they're high in lipids which is high in energy and that's kind of what they need this time of year so live smelt uh, on a tip up, it allows you to cover large, a large area. You can spread out, you can jig one rod here and put another one 150 feet or 200 feet away or, or whatever and, and cover a completely different area. And if there's more than one person, you can really spread out. 
um, and we catch a lot of fish. We caught all our fish today on, on tip-ups, lake trout, white perch. Um, yesterday was a mix of jigging and tip-ups. So it's different depending on the day. Actually, most of the fish yesterday were, was, were on the jigs, just uh, one on the tip-up. So it's, it's different by the day. And if, if you really want to just catch fish, you want to hang out, um, then certainly put some tip-ups in, but they're going to slow you down uh, as far as moving goes. If you want to move, a lot of times, you know, for me, a tip-up is an anchor. I look over at it and I'm like, oh, I don't feel like dealing with it right now. It's a process and I don't want to waste the bait. And so uh, if you're not planning on moving, definitely fish tip-ups. All right. So uh, I run just like an 18 pound tip-up line on mine. Um, I use green. I don't really think it matters all that much. It, I think it's what you can see the best. And I, I can, I like the green on the when it lays on the ice, I can see it better. So we can, I can keep people from stepping in it black. If they had black, I probably would have bought black because my, my biggest challenge with, with guiding is people will get excited and they step in the line. Some people will have a friend wind in their line as they fight the fish. I don't, I just put the line, pile the line on the ice and try to keep people out of it. So I fish the, the 18 pound, it's nice and thin. And then I fish eight pound fluorocarbon leaders and on my tip ups, I run them about 10 feet long. I start them out at 10 feet long. When they get below five feet long, I'll put a new leader on there. And I do run swivels. I run a ball bearing swivel on those. Um, okay, ball bearing swivel. And then I run, uh, let me look. Size six, Gamakatsu octopus hooks. I like the red ones. I don't know if it matters, but I like to think it does. So um, I fish those and then a small split shot, 18 inches to two feet above the hook. It's a small one, just enough to get the smelt to stay down there. And I will go bigger on, sometimes the smelt are really fresh and really active. And what they'll do is the, the split shot will hang down. The smelt will swim up and around. And um, if they can pull that split shot you know, off to the side. Sometimes you'll have to go a little heavier or a little lighter depending on, on what the smelt. If the smelt are tangling it up a lot, then change the size of your split shot and just enough to keep them down there. Um, you want them to be able to kind of swim out. You don't want them to hang straight down because if really active one, that's when they just kind of swim around it. Um, and so my general technique when the flag goes off, and I fish these, these, um, these clam trophy thermal tip-ups. I like the thermal tip-ups because they really do prevent the holes from freezing. And on a really cold day, I do them one at a time. I drill a hole, I set the tip up in that hole. I don't drill all my holes and then set tip-ups because the slush around the hole freezes. And I like to be able to take that tip up and press it down into that slush, especially on a windy day. It keeps the wind from getting in there. They're not gonna freeze over. Um, and uh, I've taken a, on mine a, a big black Sharpie and I've, I've outlined the edges and then an X across the middle of them. Um, so on certain conditions like fog and when it's snowing, those flags can get a little hard to see. But I really like the fact that you can see that, that where you hook the flag on the top, that trip spinning. So you know if the fish is running and most of the time they'll take it and they'll run and it'll stop. And we just wait, you get enough near and no reason to hurry. If it's not spinning, the fish isn't taking any line and there's no point in, you know, in, in rushing. Cause a lot of times what they'll do is spit it out and come back or they'll just grab it by the head and swim to the bottom and then suck it in. So we, we always wait for it to stop and then start spinning again. And that's when we lift it up, uh, nice and slow, lift it straight up. So the line doesn't rub on the edge and don't grab the spool and don't grab the trip because you want the fish to be able to continue to pull line out and then grab pull a little line off and set that tip up down and then you can you can do what you need what you need to do is you know a little jerk and you know we're not uh, we're not uh these aren't tuna you know we, you don't need to you know rifle and and run away from the hole these are you know lake trout like this one here so just a a, a firm jerk those these hooks are are thin they're not big fat beefy hooks so it doesn't take much to set those hooks so you don't have to yank on it and because if it, if it has it in its mouth and the line is on its teeth and you give it a good yank you can very easily uh, cut that line especially fluorocarbon will cut it right off and and break them so um that's that's what i got for 
for tip ups. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, conservation. So the growth rate of lake trout, and this comes from a study that was done in Sebago Lake, is that they grow two to four inches per year for the four, first four inches of their life. Now it's two to four, it's not always four. It depends on, on the overall health and water quality, number of fish, things like that. And then after that, it slows to an inch or less. So, you know, people want to look at it and they say they grow four inches a year. Eh, some, the really, really healthy ones, the ones with really, you know, genetics to grow fast, but, you know, split that, you know, three inches a year average. And then, you know, under an inch a year after that, they grow really, really slowly. So this fish that I'm, that I'm holding here is a, a pretty old fish if, if you do the math. Um, any guesses? on how old that fish is. That fish was 34 inches long that I'm, that I'm holding there in that picture. And I know some of you already know the answer to this um, from, my, from my seminars. Um, just any guesses. This is probably, with the lag, this is probably gonna be tough to do. Um, but that fish is over 40 years old. Uh, 34 inch lake trout is over 40 years old. So I, I never criticize anyone for killing a big fish like that and taking it home. I, I don't ever, it is everybody's right. If you're within the law and, and you're allowed to do so, I'm not, it's not that it's wrong. I just don't do it myself. I don't kill those big lake trout because they breed, they lay a lot of eggs. And if you catch a fish that big in Lake Winnipesaukee, I guarantee you there is not a school of those fish down there. There are not a lot of them in there. And if you take one out, you've removed a large portion of the gene pool for those big fish because they will breed other fish that have the ability to grow big. What they found in the lake trout study that they did in Sebago is that the majority of those fish genetically will never grow to be any bigger than 18 inches long. They'll, they'll just die. They'll max out and they'll die young and they won't get any bigger because of the genetics. It's just like deer hunting. When, when we, we use genetics in deer hunting and we're trying to um, cull, you know, the, the scraggly bucks or the wounded deer out, the ones with deformities, you try to get them out of the gene pool and leave the healthy ones in. Well, this is killing these big lake trout is, is backwards genetics. You're taking, it's the equivalent of going in and taking the most mature, the best breeder bucks out of a, um, out of a um, uh, breeding population and leaving only the scraggly ones. That's what we're doing when we kill these big lake, big lake trout. Some places can handle it. Lake Champlain has a lot of big lake trout, but if you catch a, a giant in Lake Winnipesaukee, you've, you've taken a, a pretty significant um, impact on the, on the gene pool. And I'll circle back and say again, I'm not criticizing anyone for doing it. I'm just saying I don't, and I'm trying to educate people who sometimes don't know. I've realized over the years that I've had clients, I had a client catch a 43 inch Northern and he was planning on taking it home. And then I, I let him know that there's a company like Northeast Taxidermy in Connecticut that does an incredible replica mounts that look exactly like the real thing. And he was like, well, let's just do that. And I can have it done anytime. I don't even have to keep the fish in my freezer or kill it. So if you catch a big fish like that and you are, have your heart set on a skin mount, then, you know, God bless you. I'm not gonna talk any trash about you. I can assure you, I wanna see pictures of that fish but I'll be a little bit sad. That's, that's it. I should jump off my soapbox now. So check out my YouTube channel. There's a, there's a bunch of uh, lake trout videos on there, or a few lake trout fishing videos on there. A uh, couple from, from uh, Connecticut, first Connecticut Lake. And I think there's one that I filmed with New Hampshire Fishing Game several years ago that talk about a lot of techniques and, and show a lot of this stuff. And uh, if you want to subscribe to that, I, it helps me out a lot if you haven't already. I, I've really been trying to put more energy into my YouTube. I, I find that people uh, enjoy it, they like it, it's helpful. And I try to be educational. Some of them are just fun, but I do uh, try to um, add some, you know, some learning stuff, talk a little bit about what I'm doing or why I'm, why I'm doing it. And you can come out fishing with us. That's the link to my website and some of our clients from years past. Uh, my good friend Howie, rest in peace Howie. And uh, I think that's all I got for you. So I'm gonna go look through these questions. Whew, I'm tired. All right. 
my schedule looks booked. Do I ever get a day off? I do I actually. Um, I have uh, office work I do on Monday and then Tuesday is my day to play this winter. I, this is the first year I've ever done that. Um, and yeah, we're, I'm booked solid right up until late Feb, uh, late March. I think we don't have, we have nothing. I, Chuck Fritz is going to take a couple trips for me uh, based on his availability and, you know, leaving himself some time to, to fish as well. Cause he has a, a regular full-time job. But other than that, we are booked solid. Hi, Kyle. Um, let's see. Uh oh, getting into white perch questions. <laughs> Todd, Todd, I want you to come out here and catch white perch with me. You should, you should, we should make that happen. That would be awesome. Um, let's see. Best depth for targeting white perch 25 to 40 is my favorite depth. My ideal size for tip up smelt. Um, I like them. I, I actually like. So I prefer smaller smelt. I know big, big baits catch big fish, but I, I prefer those like two and a half to three inch smelt. And part of the reason I do is I've seen a lot of lake trout puking up smelt or whether it's fall, uh, late season jigging or ice fishing. And they always seem to be keying in on those pin smelt, the really small ones. And I, I, I believe that it's because smelt are high in lipids, very high in, in lipids, which is, fat energies oils and the unique thing about smelt is that that concentration of lipid doesn't increase with size so as they get bigger that concentration doesn't increase so if they're 25 percent lipids they're all 25 percent lipids so if you're trying to increase your lipid intake you can eat a lot more of these than you can these so i will fish those two and a half to three inch smelt most of the time um I do occasionally put the big, I got some big smelt from berries um, uh, yesterday and today and, and we fished a couple of those, but we had a lot of drops. We had a lot of, a lot of hits, uh, hit and runs. And so I like the two and a half to three inch. How long do lake trout live? Uh, the oldest lake trout ever caught by an angler was um, 60 years old and it was caught in a lake in Canada called Kaminurik. Uh, the oldest lake trout ever found was the one that was found dead was 100 years old. So they, they are thought, they're believed to live to be 100 years old. So they're dinosaurs. Um, old man, I'm not sure what that means, Adrian, but Thank you everybody that's thanking me. Thanks, Sean Benton. Um, dun, 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 dun. Oh, there's a pile of comments here. Um, do I ever stay late with clients? So most, the way that my trips are structured now, clients have the opportunity to uh, book extra time. So if they wanna stay late, um, we do have a rate for extra time and so I'm rubbing the mic. I'm probably making all kinds of noise. Um, yes. Uh, if I don't have anywhere to be, um, if, you know, if, if the fishing is, is really good and people want to stay late, I usually let them, you know, book extra time if they want. The flip side of that is if the fishing has been really tough, I really want my clients to catch fish. That is the most important thing to me every single day is that my clients uh, are comfortable, but that they catch fish because that's ultimately what they came to do. So today the fishing was slow. Uh, we stayed probably an extra 40 minutes. Um, I didn't charge them for that time. I, I decided that they had nowhere to be and they could stay. So we stayed a little bit longer. So the fishing's tough. I usually, you know, if I can, if I don't have anything to do, the trouble is a lot of times I have to get ready for the next day's trip or, you know, I might have some work to do, but yes, People do have the option to stay late. Um, ice fishing this season, Kyle is off to a bit of a slow start. A lot of it's ice conditions and, and the amount of real estate that we have and the number of people that are packed into tighter areas now, I think that has an impact. Uh, Mike, I, I've used wooden jig sticks. I used to make wooden jig sticks and sell them when I, we did the Rockingham Expo every year. 
Um, so I, I have used them. It's kind of like a bait caster for me. It, it's so foreign that I've never really committed to getting used to using one, but I know a lot of people that still fish wooden jig sticks and especially for big fish, you can, you can really get a good hook set. And I don't love hand lining them either. Uh, I do like to fight them on a rod. So that's another reason I don't use wooden jig sticks, but they're certainly good. The New Hampshire Fishing Digest said that the time of day doesn't matter much for ice fishing. Well, I hate to contradict New Hampshire, the New Hampshire Fishing Digest, but I do, I do disagree. Um, well, I guess the time of day doesn't matter when you go ice fishing, unless you want to catch fish. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I like early mornings and evenings for, for white perch and lake trout. And, you know, over the years I've taught and, and become more of a believer that lake trout fishing is actually really good around eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning that I know people that don't even start. So I've, I've had old timers and over the years tell me that I'm a fool to get out there at sunup to try to catch lake trout, that they don't really bite very well until the sun comes up. I know that's true in the, during the jig bite in, in the August and September that we'll get out there in the dark and the fish are there and they won't touch it until the sun starts to come up and, and some light in the sky and, and they can see or, or just whatever. So uh, I like, I like early morning and, and the evening preferably, but that's kind of like, you know, I like to deer, I've shot more deer in the afternoon than I have in the morning and it makes me like to hunt afternoons more. I don't know. I know people that shoot more deer in the morning, so it doesn't mean that I'm right. It's just my preference. Um, Edward Miles, I hooked my smelt in the back, um, right in front of the dorsal fin and just a little ways down and barely hook any at all. And it, I find that they have better movement. Ah, yes, Adrian, that lake trout was an old man or a woman. Um, dun, 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 just scrolling through comments here. Um, I used the Buddy Flex heater the last two days. I haven't used the cooker yet, Dane. Um, I do like the heater. Uh, I do like the the fact that we can, um, you know, it's not so directional now. You get that 180 degrees. I've used, I used it yesterday and today uh, all day. And uh, it, yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, we did some grilling today, so we didn't use the cooker. But I'm excited. So for anybody that doesn't know that Mr. Heater came out with a new heater this year called the Buddy Flex. And it's a heater. You can attach a cook stove, one burner to the bottom of it, and it clips in. You can take that off and it has a hose on that's in the wraps up in the bottom of it. And you can plug it into the side of the heater and run the stove off of your heater. So you don't have to have a separate stove. Or it has a backpack too that you can put the, the cook stove, the burner in the bottom and put the heater in the top. Uh, but you can carry it around as one unit and then just unhook it and plug it in. You can't run the heater and the cooker at the same time. You have to switch over between them, but at least you don't have to have extra bottles of propane for your cooker and extra bottles for your, for your propane. You can run off the same one. My preferred lake for lake trout, Jared is asking. Um, well, I like Lake Winnipesaukee. It's just, it's my home lake, but I've over the years gained a, a huge amount of respect and passion for lake trout fishing in Lake Champlain because there are some really big fish and they just act, they behave differently than our fish do here. Most of the time, if a lake trout hits, uh, I'm going to stop sharing so you can see my face. Most of the time, if a lake trout hits here on Lake Winnipesaukee, and you miss them, that, that was your shot. They're not gonna turn around and come right back in. Uh, I caught a, a um, 12 pound lake trout on Lake, lake, lake Champlain and on my, the bottom in 90 feet of water. And I got that fish 25 feet up and I could see it on my fish finder screen coming up, I was fighting the fish and I got it 25 feet off bottom and the lure popped out of its mouth. And I opened my bale and just let the lure free fall back to the bottom and that fish went right back to the bottom and ate my lure again. After, after I had fought it 25 feet up off the bottom. Uh, and it was, um, actually it was, the, it was the fish that I just showed. 
in this presentation. Well, I can't get anything to go. That one, it was that fish right there, as a matter of fact. Um, so that's one of my favorites, but I have places that I, I have never fished that I, I really want to try um, for lake trout. Some places in Canada, I want to fish with Bernie Keefe someday. I'd love to fish with Tommy Hicks. Um, he does a, uh, I can't remember what, it, what the technique is called, but these these big reels and they're fishing in like 200 feet of water. And it's a really neat looking technique. Um, do I ever... Thanks, Todd. I appreciate that. Do I ever fish big dead suckers on tip-ups? I don't, but I'm sure everybody knows by now that that's what the state record was caught on, um, big dead suckers right on the bottom. Uh, if I were fishing in a place that had more large lake trout, I probably would, but you know, I've, I, I've heard rumors that when Tommy caught that state record, he had fished that way for several days in a row before he caught that fish, so it's, they're few and far between that way. Um, let's see. Do I have a recommendation? Whoops. On a type of knot. Yeah. YouTube is a great, uh, resource for learning how to tie knots. My favorite leader to braid knot is the FG knot. If you, it's a, it's a tricky knot to tie. It's, you definitely have to practice it a bunch. <clears throat> Excuse me. I use the uni to uni knot for years. It's easy to tie. And it's, it's, a, it's a good strong knot, but the FG knot is one of the strongest knots out there for tying leader to braid. <clears throat> and then everything else, I tie an improved clinch. Tie my swivels on with that, tie my hooks and my lures on with, with that improved clinch. So those two knots, you can easily find hundreds of YouTube videos that will use like a bigger piece of rope um, to demonstrate how to, how to tie them. Uh, yep, Sebago has decent lake trout in it. They caught some big lake trout last winter out of there. Clayton Schick, yep, he has a cool YouTube channel. I follow him on, I subscribe to him on YouTube. Mm. Kyle Brooks, I like to catch stripers uh, early in the morning and or with lures and, and stuff. Uh, it really depends, but I like to catch stripers in the dark with eels uh, or early in the morning. Those are my favorite times to fish. Um, Tom, I've never fished one of Squam for Lakers actually, but I know people that do and there's some nice fish in there. All right, uh, we're getting down there. We've been going on here for Tommy Hicks. Yep. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Todd. Um, we're talking about a couple of different Tommies here in the comment. Tommy, Tommy Cod that Adrian referenced, he, he's a local guy that caught our state record lake trout last winter. I think it was 37 pounds. Um, but um, I would like to fish with Tommy Hicks. He's the one that, uh, reeling maybe it's called reeling, that they, they keep the, the line on a reel. I can't remember. Uh, no, there's a name for it, and I can't remember what it is. Rocking or something like that. Anyway, I'm drawing a blank. Will Lively, I do not guide on any other New Hampshire lakes, uh, especially in the winter. Um, I, do, I do a few uh, smallmouth kayak trips on my home lake in Barrington, Nipple Lake. There's some nice smallmouth bass in here. And a lot of them, it's a small lake, and I live right here on it. So I'll do a few weekday trips in the spring here um, but for the most part that's it everything's on winnie i keep my boat on uh, at a marina so that's that bobbing yes thank you todd god I must be getting old all right i think uh we're winding down we got about half as many people on here right now so i'm gonna thank everybody i'll go through these comments again uh, and make sure I, I didn't miss any questions and try to answer them all. Thanks thanks for everyone that tuned in. Thank you to Kittery Trade and Post and uh, Clam and Daddy Mac for, for their support. And I will 
uh, I will um, announce the winner of this. I'll go through these questions and pick one. I'm just going to pick somebody. Um, it's not going to be anything too high tech, um, but I'm just going to pick somebody at random. I'll probably just scroll and open my eyes and whoever's question I'm looking at, or maybe I'll find a favorite question, but somebody's going to get this hat and I'll notify you uh, in the comments and I'll try to message you. So if you get a message request from me, don't block me because <laughs> I'm going to be trying to give you a hat and uh, we'll get that sent out uh, there. Let's see. I saw a couple more questions come in real quick. Uh, Might've missed them. Okay. Uh, Dexelar is at Kittery. There were, I don't know if there still are. You can check their inventory online. You can, if it's available for purchase online, then it will be available to go in and get. So there, but they were, they had FL 18s and FL X 28s the last time I was there. All right. All right. That's it. I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks everybody so much. This was fun. February 11th is the white perch uh, webinar. And this is going to be, it, make some popcorn because it is going to be a very, very long white perch seminar. I am going to, so I have a, a lot of different versions of that white perch seminar that I, that I give. Um, sometimes I'm limited to an hour. Sometimes I'm limited to, to about 40 minutes with questions. So I will use different versions. This is going to be everything. So I'm going to do all the information from all of my different white perch seminars are going to be in this one. And it's probably going to be the most in-depth white perch, sem perch seminar that I've ever given. I'm going to try to throw everything except my exact spots. Uh, in there. So if you're hoping to, to get my secret spots here, sorry to disappoint you ahead of time, but please still come to the, to the seminar. Um, that's February 11th at 6.30 uh, here live. Tomorrow night, um, I'm going to be uh, going live with my buddy Matt Raldron. He's a Vexilar service tech uh, and a tournament angler from Minnesota. He knows um, pretty much everything there is to know about Vexilar flashers. And he's gonna answer a few common questions about the new lithium batteries, about the new FLX30BB, some of the differences between that and the FLX28. And then if there's time, we'll take some questions from the comments. So that's tomorrow night. That's gonna be right here at the TMO, uh, Timor Outdoors Facebook page. So if you have Vexilar questions, definitely tune into that tomorrow night because you'll get the answers right from the horse's mouth. And the reason I put this together is because I, I see a lot of questions in the Facebook groups and I get, I see these answers that aren't accurate or I see people say, well, Vexilar told me and it's things that I know, you know, Vexilar didn't say. So we're going to get it straight from a Vexilar service tech tomorrow night. So if you have questions, tune into that. Um, I can't remember what time that's going to be. I will look right now and make sure i think it's eight oh it's 8 p.m 8 p.m eastern 7 p.m central tomorrow night and it's not going to be as long as this one but we're going to try to get your questions answered so thank you very much everybody i super appreciate it this was a fun one and i'm gonna go rest my voice and hug my girlfriend hope you all have a good night we'll see you on the next one thanks again